Dublin at the turn of the 20th century was an intriguing place. In many ways, it seems close to the present. This was, after all, for many of us, the world of our great-grandparents. However, at the same time, this Dublin can seem incomprehensibly different. What our ancestors endured just 120 years ago in terms of the conditions they lived in, worked in and their life expectancy is often unimaginable. In this episode, I'm joined by Dr. Kira Brannock. Kira's new book, Ordinary Lives, Death and Social Class, Dublin City Coroner's Court, 1876 to 1902, provides an intimate insight into day-to-day life in Dublin at the end of the 19th century. While inquests investigate sudden, unnatural and suspicious deaths, Kira has used them to create a vivid picture of the lives that ultimately ended up the subject of inquests. As you'll hear, our conversation looked at lots of aspects of life, from things like how low life expectancy was in the city, to what people died of, and then the generally appalling living standards at the time. However, by focusing on the individual cases before the coroner's court, Kira has created a remarkably personalised history from the time, where the lives of people usually forgotten by history takes centre stage. Now before we dive in, I want to introduce myself. My name is Finn Dwyer and this is the Irish History Podcast. If this is your first time tuning in, don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. To explain a bit more about today's guest, Dr. Kira Brannock is an Associate Professor of History in the University of Limerick. She's an Irish Research Council Laureate Awardee and currently a Fulbright Scholar researching the lives of Irish immigrants in New York. Now, her book, Ordinary Lives, Death and Social Class, Dublin City Coroner's Court, 1876 to 1902, is well worth checking out, as you're about to hear in this interview. I've links to where you can buy it in the show notes below to both the print and ebook versions. You can also find out more about Kira's other publications in the links below as well. Finally, if you're looking for even more content, don't forget my audio book on the Black Death in Ireland is available now at Acast Plus in the links below as well. You can buy this through a once-off payment. You're not subscribing to a recurring payment at all. But for just $6.99, you get over three hours of fascinating content on the great plague of the 14th century. But now to the interview. Kira's research looked at Dublin through the lens of the city's coroner's court. Now before continuing, I asked her to explain exactly who was afforded an inquest and why. If you end up in the coroner's court, it means that you have died suddenly, you have died in suspicious circumstances or in unnatural ways. So that doesn't happen to the middle classes. It happens to the poor. And I felt it was very important that to to establish what socioeconomic conditions were. So I use various different source materials in the book. I use photographs. I use maps. And I use various different types of resources to bring that Dublin to life because it's very important because it was all of these social and economic conditions that that produced these prim- often very pr- premature deaths. It's also a period of very high uh, infant mortality and the chances of making it out of childhood in, in Dublin in 1900 to making it beyond the age of five were very slim. So life expectancy was very poor, more generally for adults. and And it is, of course, pre-drug therapy. So life was was very short, unfortunately, and working lives were very hard. So yeah, for me, it was important to establish the social and economic conditions in order to be able to understand the cases that came before the coroner's court. To get a better handle on life and indeed death in Dublin at the turn of the 20th century, I asked Kira about life expectancy in the city at the time. Now her answer here really took me aback. It's not just how young people were dying, but where a person was born could also be a factor. So it depends on what social class you come from. Then um, the lifespan can be affected by lots of things. Say, for example, uh, for a working class person, 40, 50 would be fairly good going. What I noticed as well, and again, I would need to do some more research on this, was a difference between those who were Dublin born and those who had come up from the country. So people who have kind of, I suppose, a better nutritional start in life, perhaps coming from rural contexts, tended to fare better in the city if they if there was internal migration. That requires an awful lot more research, uh, Finn, 
and it's something that I, I would hope to do at a later stage. But I can certainly see a difference in say, I suppose, the the way in which people who are internal migrants can have advantage over people who are Dublin born and second and third generation Dublin is, I think, something that requires more research. Because if you come up from from Kerry, for example, where I'm from, and you move to Dublin, you can you can probably find ways into social advantage and social mobility that people who are Dublin born may not. And again, that nutritional advantage is something that requires more research, because if you have a diet that is rich in, um, say, natural produce uh, coming from the natural economy of barter as against the cash economy in Dublin, it's a very different it's a very different uh, life expectancy. And of course, there is a project right now in, uh, over the last 20 years, uh, Tilda at uh, Trinity, that examines the matter of life expectancy. But in Dublin in 1900, it's it's socially conditioned. Middle classes live live longer, you know, between five and ten years longer, and perhaps longer again. So obviously, the the idea of a hard working, physically hard working life is going to shorten your lifespan, and you're exposed to far more risks and dangers as a working class manual laborer than you would be if you were a middle class banker. So it, it all depends. Your life expectancy can be, you know, localized as well. And I think at Dublin City Centre, economic historians have estimated it at about 40, 50. Now, this is remarkably young compared to 21st century Ireland. Kira went on to explain what these people were dying of. Obviously, infectious disease is a really big problem at the beginning of the 20th century. And for what really stands out to me is the impact of respiratory disease. Tuberculosis, pulmonary tuberculosis is, is a real killer in adults and young adults in particular. And when you consider how it's spread on factory floors, et cetera, et cetera, it does take a toll. And even though there weren't that many factories in Dublin or manufacturing locations, I mean there were there were some obviously, but not 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 comparable to Belfast. Again, the work of Brita Jones is really important here because she sets the she sets the the, the kind of baseline for the study. She also argues that women with repeat pregnancies are more susceptible to latent tuberculosis. I mean, the, tuberculosis can attack any part of the body. That's the other thing to remember. In children, it's tabes mesenterica, which is something that attacks the the membranes of the G, the, the GI system. So it, it's always sensitive to your your life stage. So causes of death among on uh, infants would have been obviously inadequate feeding was a big problem, or underfeeding or uh, undernourishment was a big problem. Any kind of say children who were bottle fed, if the if the sanitary conditions weren't right, of course, that was very dangerous to children. Uh, you have to also remember that sanitation in Dublin City wouldn't have been great in 1900. So so that there was risks in the in the domestic environment to young children and, of course, to older people as well in terms of decrepit housing. So what causes death is communicative diseases and infectious diseases in the main. And um, that changes in Ireland uh, from the 1940s and 50s onwards. We see a drop in infant mortality. And that's because of, of course, the rise of drug therapy and the interventions of things like antibiotics, um, which is a, a major advance in medical science. Of course, too expensive in the first iterations of it. But um, there's a major shift that happens pretty much all of a sudden in the 50s. And that puts pay to things like infant mortality. But infant mortality rates in Dublin were just extraordinary, just really quite extraordinary in, in, in the inner city. As we moved on to discuss specific cases that ended up before the coroner's court, some of the most revealing were those that originated in the family home. These provided a tragic insight into the cramped lives in Dublin's tenements, the houses of the poor where several families had to share one house. I think what really guts me is actually the 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 burns and skulls, and it's uh, small children who are being dressed in front of the fireplace, a fireplace that was never meant for cooking, that was a fireplace for a bedroom in an erstwhile Georgian townhouse. It was never ever supposed to bear a pot or a pan, and certainly not supposed to uh, heat an entire household and feed them, and. And it just, you know, you, you have the likes of Charles Cameron saying, oh, they don't they they don't fry their meat. You know, everything is a is a soup or a stew. Of course it is. It's a one pot dish. And it's just it, it, it brings to mind the, the level of poverty in the city and um, children kind of 
falling into pots of boiling water, somebody taking a pot off the off these fireplaces and placing it on the floor and turning their back for two seconds, and then a child is burned or scalded. It's just uh, really devastating stuff and stuff that we don't see happening anymore because there are safety measures in place. And um, to be fair to the coroner, he was very sympathetic in such cases. And uh, there was one horrific case as well, just in terms of falls of a woman who went downstairs to dispose of some water. And uh, she watched her child fall down through the stairs, through the staircase and uh, plummet to her death. So and these these deaths by burning and falls are not just confined to children. It's it, it's older people, too. And if you think about the lack of mobility aids for people who perhaps lived on upper floors and um, older people, their life must have been so much more limited. I mean, if you've ever known or lived with somebody with limited uh, mobility, you know, being upstairs, I mean, if they if they couldn't walk down the stairs safely, then, you know, they were in, they were in a bit of trouble, you know, getting up and down stairs. So, so it, it, for me, it was the confines of the of the tenements that were really palpable in these records. The fact that people lived in one room and these rooms were families of anything up to 10 children or more. And uh, it's extraordinary to think of the pressures, particularly on mothers, to look after small children in such confined spaces. The story of Winifred Lambert indicates how overcrowding made life dangerous in the most unexpected ways. Winifred Lambert was basically a a young child. Uh, She was four years of age and her father had gotten a nagging of whiskey to basically rub in the gums of her younger sibling who was teething. And he had placed the whiskey on, on the mantelpiece, thinking that it was out of the way. And of course, Winifred reached up and and drank from it and and it ended up that she ended she ended up dying of alcohol poisoning and again this is how that I think that uneasy relationship between um, poor households and working class households in the state really comes to mind here because if that had happened in a middle class household I doubt if it would have ended up before the coroner's court many of these cases end up before the coroner's court because poverty is so often conflated with neglect in this Dublin which I, I find quite infuriating. And and there's a lack of empathy there, and there's so much of of there's so much bias built into the entire process, even though they're eventually shown a fair degree of compassion at the other side by both the coroner and the jury, if they're considered deserving. If those parents had had a reputation of being hard drinkers, they wouldn't have been shown the same kind of compassion. And there's all kinds of respectability indicators that punctuate the the Dublin Metropolitan Police account and then the, the 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 witness statements afterwards. So they know what to say, misses this, and you know, her husband was out at work that day, or she's a, a widow, again a respectability indicator, um, which which I find quite extraordinary. But in the case of poor Winifred, she she died. And it was because uh, as you say, Fen, of the limited confines of the home, no place to lock things away and particularly dangerous substances like that. And in that case, and again, it points to another big problem of addiction in the city. And there was a big problem with alcoholism. And um, we don't see cases of methylated spirits drinking coming into play here. But certainly in court cases later on, we see people like meth dealers in and around the same areas of Dublin and being prosecuted kind of around 20 years later and in this particular case with Winifred Lambert, they um, they investigate the proof of the alcohol that was used, and um, it, it's quite an quite an interesting thing because the bottle is examined and the proof is examined, and um, the person who sold the the bottle of alcohol is also called into question. So I wondered as well as I was going through these cases, and I discussed it with friends of mine, Sarah Ann Buckley who has worked a lot on, um, of course, on on child cruelty and neglect. And she agrees with me in that I don't think people realise the proof of the alcohol that they were drinking at the time. And there's usually, and of course, we've all done it, you know, I've only had one or two drinks and they probably had 10 or 20, you know, Um, but uh, they didn't realise how much they had been drinking. But I wondered as well if they were cognizant, cognizant of the proof of the alcohol that they were drinking.
The cases in the coroner's court also provide an insight into aspects of late 19th century life that we rarely think about. Kira now explains this incident that began on a train. It's a universal story we've all faced about antisocial behaviour on public transport, but it also provides a great insight into life in the late 19th century. The final sections of the tram network in Dublin were, were electrified in the period I'm looking at. And people would regularly, in the case of James Kelly, who was a conductor on the tram, I suppose he was working on a tram that was very busy with regards to what we might call Sunday drinking. And uh, people who would go out on a Sunday to places like Holt or Dunleary to avail of, I don't know, f- uh, fresh air or maybe some refreshments, etc. And I think we have a case here whereby James Kelly was the conductor on the tram and uh, he got very annoyed with a man named Mr. Duffy, who was a bit belligerent and tried to smoke a cigarette on the on the tram. And then he was kind of asking, when are we getting off? When are we get?" And, and James Kelly lost patience and he pushed him and uh, he fell on the tracks and he was run over. It was witnessed. It was quite a violent attack and it was witnessed by several others and including his family who seemed quite fearful of suffering the same fate themselves. In fact, they were threatened with the same fate themselves and his family members tried to intervene it seems that there was a there was a wider group of them that had gone to hold for the day. Uh, at the at the end of the day, what happened was the conductor and the driver were exonerated from all blame, and um, it was it was just a very unfortunate case. And and again, as you say, Fen, things that we don't really think of. Uh, that's a, a quite unusual case. There were several cases of people being knocked down, and I found it quite extraordinary. You know why people didn't hear a tram coming. But then it makes you think of the level of noise in the city. And there must have been the cacophony of white noise that always formed the the, the soundtrack or the backbeat to the city, whereby children didn't hear the danger of horses and hooves uh, coming for them. All drivers were arrested at the scene. They were usually exonerated afterwards. And if it happened that the case involved the train or the tram company, there was always a rider. The, the jury added a rider in cases that they felt there was a case for compensation. They would usually make a plea for compensation to the train or tram company, to the parent or the or the widow, or as the case may be. But it really made me think about the soundscape of the city. And again, it's an area of uh, urban history research um, that has received very little attention. And uh, it's something that we should probably look more closely at. So people wouldn't have heard, particularly children, wouldn't have heard uh, shouts of pull up, move back, get out of the way or or whatnot. And again, it comes back to the limited space in the home. So small children viewed the street in front of their houses as their an extension of their house. Of course they did. It was their play area. And because of the trams on the roads, other traffic got pushed into smaller laneways. And it created further dangers for children. So we have, David Thomas has actually written about this in, in Cork. We have a, a major tussle going on at this time between H car drivers or hackney car drivers who drove uh, horses and carts and the new innovations of trams and trains. So there's no love lost between the two. So it's the old and new worlds colliding, if you will. And unfortunately, there are several deaths and the deaths are horrendous as well for people who work on the railways. They're absolutely horrendous, very distressing cases for for families to to deal with. And the condition of the bodies is described in a very macabre way in the newspapers. Straightforward murder cases were far rarer in late Victorian Dublin than we might imagine. However, the inquests into people who were murdered reveal a complexity to life in the city at the time that was often obscured by sensational newspaper headlines. There were very few cases of uh, of murder here. And in fact, only one case that that, that, that ends up as a capital punishment case. In fact, that was a, a man, the, the, the first man hanged in uh, Mount Joy, John Toole. And in one week, there was a case, there were two cases of women who had their throats slit by an intimate partner. And uh, in one case, the perpetrator of the crime 
had previously spent time at her at, a, at his at her Majesty's pleasure in um in in a asylum, and uh, because of that, he sent to uh, a man named George Pepper. He sent to the Central Criminal Lunatic Asylum. The other case ends up in in a hanging in uh, in Mount Joy, but both cases exhibited, I would say, mental illness. The man who was never entered into into um, evidence, John Toole had uh, been invited to leave America. He'd been invited to leave Chicago because he was problematic in many ways. And he had tried to, it, was, it wasn't it was in fact a case of murder-suicide, but his own suicide attempt had been unsuccessful. He unfortunately uh, murdered um, Lizzie Elizabeth Brennan, or Lizzie Toole. She had several al- aliases and his own, his own attempt on his own life was unsuccessful, but he is, I think, made it an example of, and and that and that's the case that ends up as a capital punishment case. In most of the other cases, there are one punch incidents, a drunken night out, one fellow pushes another, hits his head, and that's just it. Unfortunately, there's a there's a fatality from it. These are terrible things. Very often, they end up in like very. If if they are prosecuted at all, the sentencing is just ridiculous. It's like a couple of months and they only serve a couple of, uh, you know, maybe given a year and they only serve about three or four months. The judges, when handing down sentences in some of these cases, often had to grapple between competing ideas of justice. Sometimes locking up a guilty person could create even more problems. Kira explains this particularly sad case. There's one horrific case of a man who throws an, an, an implement at his wife and goes smash. He, 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 this is a case of domestic violence. He puts his wife and son out of the house and the son has tried to go in between his drunken father and, and his mother. And when they're both put out, outside of the house, the father throws an instrument out the window and it hits the child on the head and the child dies afterwards. and. In that case, the judge, he's brought before the courts for manslaughter and whatnot, but the judge is again faced with the decision of, do I plunge this family into poverty by sending the breadwinner to jail for an extended period of time, or do I give him a lighter sentence? Which, of course, ends up what ha- as what happens. He gets 12 months and he only serves a few because we know from the census that he's back living with the family a couple of months later. Sarah Ann Buckley's work, again, it covers this. Uh, she's looked at these these conundrums that judges face, but every now and again they make a stand. And in the instance of John Toole, we can see the 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 judge has writes extensive notes in it because there are petitions for clemency to uh, spare his life. The judge kind of find it in him, in himself to to let both cases go because there's two cases in the one week that emerge. True bills are found against both men, George Pepper and John Toole, and. And he makes an example of uh, John Toole, who very definitely made a, a suicide attempt, so much so that when he is hanged, the, the gash on his neck actually opens because he had cut himself so deeply, but was unsuccessful in his endeavour. But I think judges are, are faced with uh, very, very difficult decisions, and most of them act in, in terms of compassion towards the people that come before the courts. And um, they're they're compassionate as well when it comes to poor mothers, uh, but only if they're respectable poor mothers. To finish, Kira did have a somewhat uplifting take from her time spent researching these cases that often portray a very bleak aspect of life. The extraordinary heroism of women, and uh, in in a city that limited their movements, their actions. And uh, particularly for poor women, I think that it gave me an extraordinary insight into their lives. And there was always a woman who ran to assist, who nursed or uh, dressed the wounds of or grabbed the burning child from, ran to the hospital with. And their actions are rarely acknowledged as heroic deeds in the newspapers. Whereas like the, the Dublin Fire Brigade are always kind of you know, valorised. They're like, oh, wow, the extraordinary her- heroism of Captain Purcell and his men coming to the rescue, et cetera, et cetera. But there was always an older woman who knew what to do, that people went to. or and, and indeed, giving evidence in cases that were very tricky 
they put their own local reputations on the line to give evidence about people who were violent or to protect women. I have one fantastic case of a woman who, it's terrible of me to say this, of course, but she takes a man to task because he's clearly a violent man and he is um, a domestic abuser and she gives him a hiding and uh, he dies from it. And a couple of days later, he, he, he dies from it. And she, I'm probably putting this in a very indelicate way, but because she's a woman, it's glossed over in the courts because there's there's this funny kind of attitude towards masculinity at the beginning of the 20th century and what it means to be a man. And of course, a woman could never have perpetrated this kind of violence. And she's not brought before the courts, Bridget Tracy. And he threatens her. He was like, you know, I'm going to get her. Finally, I'd like to thank Kira for her time. You can find links to Ordinary Lives, Death and Social Class, Dublin City Coroner's Court, 1876 to 1902, in the show notes below. As I said earlier, it's a really great read. I'd strongly recommend it. Until next time, Sloan. <laughs>